2024 is a pivotal year for European space policy as the European Space Agency unveils its new generation of launchers amid intensifying international competition. For more on this developing space race, watch our interview with the Director General of the European Space Agency, Josef Ashbacher, in the Global Conversation. Josef Ashbacher, hello. The European rocket Vega has launched a new satellite. In July, Ariane 6 was a success. Would you say that the launcher crisis is over? Yes, uh, we are on the best way to get out of the launcher crisis, uh, but uh, I really would like to say that ESA delivers. Uh, we have uh, delivered uh, Ariane 6 uh, successfully into orbit, and this is, uh, is not a small thing uh, because this rocket delivers satellites uh, into orbit which we need for daily life, uh, and this is really fundamental. So really big, uh, a big step for Europe uh, and a uh, very big success for Europe. And just uh, recently we launched uh, Sentinel-2C uh, with the last uh, flight on Vega. Vega was uh, an, uh, the ESA rocket in the smaller segment, uh, which we developed some more than 10 years ago. And I think Europe can be very proud and very happy of this continuous series of uh, successes which we deliver. Would you say that Europe is back to space? Oh, Europe is certainly back to space. Uh, we had a small crisis uh, with launches uh, for about one year. Uh, we did not have our own launch capability, but with Ariane 6 back on the launch pad, with uh, Vega now having launched successfully uh, the Sentinel 2C, with Vega C coming at the end of this year, certainly 2024 is the year when Europe gets out of the launcher crisis. But let me just put it a bit in context, uh, because sometimes uh, we hear negative news and Europe in the launcher crisis, and yes, this was all true. But also our big partner in the United States, NASA, for 10 years was relying on Russia uh, to bring astronauts uh, into the space station. Uh, of course, now with uh, SpaceX and the Crew Dragon, this, uh, this has changed. And now, again, America has, uh, the U.S. has its own uh, astronaut flight capability. But uh, having a gap in a long series of launches and successes is, I'm not saying normal, but is not a, a completely unusual thing. But yes, I'm so happy that we are getting out of this crisis now very strong. Can we say that Europe has regained some of its strategic autonomy? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Europe is uh, actually strong in a number of domains, uh, but uh, I'm always comparing Europe with the United States, obviously, as the other major space nation. Of course, China is another one, but in China we do not have uh, uh, such uh, figures, financial figures, and how much investments are made. But if you compare Europe uh, with the United States, uh, um, Europe invests about one-sixth uh, in the public sector uh, in space. Um, uh, so the U.S. Uh, about six times as much. Uh, the figures are the global public investment in space today is about 108 billion euros uh, uh, in the year 2023. Sixty-four percent uh, of this is in the United States and 11 percent in Europe. So you see there's a factor of six uh, in between. Uh, despite the fact that we are uh, investing much less uh, in, uh, in space uh, compared to the United States uh, through NASA and the Space Force, Europe is, ac Europe is actually really good. We have some of the programs which are among the best in the world. I take Copernicus as one example where we really have uh, built up over 25, more than 25 years, one of the world's or maybe the world best uh, space program in Earth observation. Uh, we are delivering 300 terabytes of data worldwide to every citizen uh, around the globe for agriculture, for forestry, for uh, fire brigade uh, users, for civil protection, for uh, ship routing, and many, many uh, disciplines because these data are used uh, across the board in the, in the economy. So this is really a fantastic uh, new program. The other leading program where Europe uh, has again built up uh, over uh, more than 20 years uh, a very strong program is Galileo. Galileo delivers today the most accurate uh, navigation signal worldwide, more accurate than GPS, by the way. Of course, we have still work to do, and there are other programs where we have to really catch up. On launches, we are just about to catch up. Of course, you always compare with uh, SpaceX and Falcon 9, and there still we have a long way to go. But again, ESA has made decisions that we are also going uh, the similar way of uh, buying a service from a private launcher company, like uh, the... Uh, the situation is in the United States, uh, where NASA is buying launchers or the Space Force is buying launchers uh, uh, from SpaceX. You said Europe is doing really good, but we see some European companies or European bodies relying on some um, foreign companies like SpaceX. How do you react when you see Europeans turning to, to the US? Of course, uh, uh, we 
need to build up our own strength. And uh, as I said, we are investing much less uh, in uh, space compared to the United States. If I put another figure, uh, if you divide the public investment in space per capita, uh, in the United States, this figure is about 220 uh, euros per person. Uh, in Europe, it's about 20. So there's a factor of 10 in between, uh, simply because uh, the European population is, is larger, including the member states uh, of ESA. So again, we really need to catch up because space is so strategic and is so important for the future, for all levels of society. I mentioned uh, some of them from agriculture to forestry and civil protection, but also security becomes more and more an issue. Uh, let me take security as a, as a case. Uh, in the United States, about 65% of the public investment is used for defense and security, 65%. In Europe, it's about 12%. So again, much lower uh, portion uh, on security and defense uh, compared to uh, or within a much lower budget. So again, you see there that in the security defense, uh, there is really no comparison uh, between the investments of the U.S. And, uh, and Europe. And again, this is something which I would expect, but these are political decisions. It's not for me to uh, decide on these investments, but these are political decisions. But it is expected that the investments here are increasing. Because of the launch crisis, has Europe fallen behind its space program and can it catch up? We can catch up. Uh, I mentioned Copernicus, Galileo as examples where Europe had about 20 years, uh, I would say, delay in initiating these programs. But today they are world best programs. So yes, we have been catching up and we can do that. Uh, of course, we need to catch up in, in the launcher sector. Then we need to really invest uh, massively uh, to catch up and make sure that we can deliver our satellites into space. Also in broadband internet, for example, Starlink, of course, is dominating uh, today uh, the broadband internet constellations. And Europe uh, is on the, on the verge of building up its own activity with Iris Square, which is just about uh, to, to be initiated. But still, we have to catch up there because there's such a big dominance uh, on the world market. But this only goes with uh, major investments uh, uh, that are needed. Where does Europe stand in this international competition? My Europe is uh, excellent, but small. Uh, excellent uh, in terms of intellectual capability, uh, technological capability. Our industry is one of the world's most competitive industry worldwide. Uh, uh, and the investments which we do are really well invested. And this is, I would also uh, like to say, thanks to the system that the European Space Agency has built up over decades to build up an industry which is used to compete against each other and therefore be really, really on the edge and very sharp in terms of quality and technology they deliver. They're really among the best in the world. But, and this is the big danger which I see, uh, we are getting too small compared to the acceleration that takes place worldwide. For example, the global space economy today is about 470 billion euros, uh, including also the services segment. It is growing by about 15 percent. Uh, but most of this growth, unfortunately, is happening in the US and in China. And Europe is stagnant. Uh, meaning that if Europe is stagnant, we are falling behind. And this we cannot risk because uh, space is just too important as a, as a sector, as an element for daily life today already, but much more in the future. What is missing? Do we need more investment by member states or by private companies? We need both. Uh, we need uh, certain investments by the public sector. Uh, if I mention the public investments uh, in the United States, only because of uh, the big investments uh, uh, by NASA, by the Space Force, companies like SpaceX can uh, develop into what they are today. They are enormously successful, but it's also fair to say that without NASA, they would be by no means uh, in the stage where they are today, both technically, because technically NASA has provided engineers uh, in building up the Falcon uh, rocket and engine, uh, has really helped uh, quite a lot uh, the teams, uh, the commercial teams of SpaceX, but also financially in order to make it possible because NASA was playing the role of anchor customer and therefore buying rocket launches uh, from SpaceX, or, but also others. Uh, and uh, there, of course, the dimensions are much bigger. So what does Europe need to do uh, to succeed? Europe has the excellence. Europe has the capabilities. Europe has the talents. I want them to keep all our talents in Europe. I would not like them to go all the way to Silicon Valley or other places. Of course, some of them will be happily doing that. But I would like to create programs that keep uh, European talents in Europe. And this can only be done by really investing and making sure that we have the right boundary conditions, but also the right projects and, 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 and dreams uh, to keep Europeans here and really 
help them flourishing and being successful. European space policy has been designed during peacetime. Is it fit for wartime? For European space technology is by nature dual use. Uh, many of the technologies we are developing are used uh, for civilian as well as uh, defense purposes. Take me, let me take a very simple example, metrology. We are developing geostationary and polar orbiting satellites since many decades uh, for Europe, since the 70s. Um, and the weather satellite, there's only one geostationary satellite called Meteosat, now in its uh, third generation, and it is used to collect data uh, for weather forecasts. But there's only one. There's not one for the military and one for civilian. It's one satellite. And then, of course, the data streams go for civilian weather forecast for the farmers uh, to see when they should harvest their crop or for the defense uh, community uh, for uh, defense purposes. So, yes, uh, uh, technology in space is quite naturally dual use. Uh, launches is another example, uh, but also uh, ESA is... Uh, building up together and for the European Union the Galileo uh, uh, system. The Galileo system has one signal called the PRS signal which actually is used uh, for uh, and built for the defense community. So yes we are doing this since uh, many years but you're absolutely right uh, the uh, real use or the dedicated use of uh, space for defense in Europe is very small compared to the United States, compared to China, compared to India compared to Russia uh, or compared to Japan or other countries. So yes, there is a, a strange situation that Europe in defense uh, proper is investing much less than other countries. How can we ensure Europe space security? Well, Europe is working on many domains in security. We have all the tools and the capabilities available. It's really a political decision whether Europe wants to engage stronger or further. This is, uh, these are decisions to be made by politicians. I'm not a politician. I'm uh, the head of uh, the European Space Agency and therefore the head of an implementing agency. But it is really our member states uh, within the ESA context. We have 22 member states or the European Union for whom we work on space programs to make these decisions. So yes, ESA is ready and capable of working more in security. But this decision has to be made by member states and politicians. Can you assure that a European will walk on the moon by the end of the decade? By the end of this decade, um, I cannot ensure because here we have to work with uh, NASA. Uh, NASA is, of course, our partner with whom we work on the Artemis program. Uh, we work very successfully. What I can say is that uh, what is already um, assured is that we have three European astronauts, ESA astronauts, who will be uh, flying on the Artemis program. But so far, these flights are to the gateway, uh, which is the station, the, the orbital station around the moon, but not yet on the moon surface. On the moon surface, uh, this needs new agreements and new investments, uh, and this uh, is not, has yet to be done, so this is not yet uh, guaranteed. I think this will be a challenge um, to have it by the end of this decade, because uh, uh, it will take some time to have uh, non-U.S citizens on the moon surface uh, and this uh, certainly is something that we have as an ambition very clearly but there's no data or no agreement made yet. Why is it important to have a European in a NASA mission? Um, there's one very simple reason. First of all we have worked with NASA for many decades very successfully but there's also the issue of cost. Uh, of course uh, a mission to the moon is a major investment. I think uh, medium to long term Uh, Europe should build up its own capability to be more autonomous and have its own uh, capability of bringing European astronauts uh, on, with its own means to the moon. But as a first step, we are working, of course, very closely hand in hand with NASA, who is a very trusted and a very reliable partner. Actually, to the extent that NASA also relies on ESA for some very critical components to bring astronauts to the moon and to the moon surface, the Orion Uh, capsule, which is the, the capsule that brings astronauts uh, to the moon and back, uh, is powered by the European Service Module. And the European Service Module is provided by ESA, uh, and uh, we have already delivered uh, some of them for the first flight, which was, was without astronauts, but also for the flights with astronauts, they could not fly to the moon without ESA, without ESA contribution. Many voices in the European Union suggest a greater integration of the European market to uh, foster European uh, space policy. Is it a step in the right direction? Yeah, I had very good discussions also with Letter uh, when he was preparing his report, but also with uh, uh, the team of uh, Mario Draghi, uh, whose report is also uh, coming out now. Uh, and yes, um, uh, the, uh, space is uh, 
Space has many dimensions. Space has a technical dimension, uh, a scientific dimension, a climate dimension, but also an industrial dimension and a market dimension. Uh, and it is clear that uh, for Europe to compete and to be competitive on the world market, that means uh, uh, vis a vis other partners uh, worldwide, yes, we have to make sure that we are putting our assets together in the best possible way. Uh, and what uh, we have to do certainly is to reinforce uh, the cooperation between the European Union uh, through the European Commission uh, and, of course, the EU institutions and the European Space Agency. ESA has launched this cargo return service. Is the program on track? Uh, the program is very much on track. And what I really liked about this program is, first of all, the decision by member states that we change gear on how we procure space hardware in the future. It's a complete paradigm shift. Uh, instead of developing a satellite from the very beginning uh, to the very end with all little details which uh, you might want to specify, we decided, or member states decided, that we buy a service. That means we buy a service of uh, a cargo, say 4,000 uh, kilos, uh, that is being transported from the Earth's surface to the space station, is docking on the space station, uh, is uh, unloaded, and then again some two tons of cargo are re-entering into the Earth's uh, atmosphere and landing safely on, on the Earth's surface. And this is a capability which we don't have today, this re-entry capability. Uh, so this paradigm shift is quite fundamental and it's very important to speed up our innovation, to give industry more freedom to develop its spacecraft the way how they want to do it, or their cargo return vehicle, uh, and give them freedom uh, to choose their partners as they wish to choose them. But the other element that is quite important is we have been very fast in making the decision uh, and implementing this contract. Between the decision, which was made by ministers in November 2023, and the kickoff of the contract, meaning all the steps in between, including decisions by member states, industry writing its proposal, ESA evaluating it, negotiating, and us, me signing the contract, there was less than six months. And that is also quite fast uh, in order to really speed up this chain. So this paradigm shift of ESA becoming an anchor customer uh, and on the other side, being faster and more agile as an agency is something that uh, I'm really implementing very strongly with the European Space Agency, and you will see much more in the future of this kind. Isn't it dangerous to rely on private companies? Well, there is uh, a risk, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Uh, there's a risk, uh, I mean, what happens if the company is not succeeding? What happens if uh, uh, the company is bought up or is leaving Europe? I mean, these are, of course, risks that we, uh, that we know very well. But we have a lot of measures built in to cater for these risks, uh, to make sure that our investment is well preserved and uh, we keep certainly the quality and the excellence uh, within the interests of European taxpayers. You've launched a Charter Zero Debris. Are you able to convince your partners? Uh, we have already convinced them. Uh, we have already uh, uh, about half our, more than half our member states who have signed up to it. Uh, we have several rounds of signatures. We have uh, about 40, more than 40 companies uh, who have uh, signed up uh, to the charter worldwide, uh, most of them in Europe, of course, but including uh, some companies in the US. Amazon, as, uh, as one example, has signed up. Uh, Amazon as a, a strong space group, uh, program, as, as you know, with Kuiper uh, as uh, a new constellation being uh, uh, installed and developed uh, right now. So yes, uh, this is a very attractive um, charter. And I think it just makes good common sense. I mean, uh, we are having today about 10,000 satellites in orbit, um, and they are all creating debris. We have uh, about 30,000, uh, actually closer to 40,000 uh, uh, debris uh, pieces that are larger than 10 centimeters. Uh, they are very dangerous because they could hit another spacecraft and, uh, and destroy it or make it uh, not working properly. Uh, so yes, there's huge amounts of debris. It keeps increasing every day. And... Uh, the request uh, uh, from my side is that wants to sign up to the Charter should just promise that at the end of the life of satellite, they don't leave it in space, but they bring it out of space. And that's the very simple principle of the Charter, that uh, uh, you, just like going to a national park, you take your, your food, your lunch box with you, you eat your lunch, uh, but you don't leave waste behind. You take the waste back out, so you keep the national, national park um, uh, clean. And that's what we want to do in space, that uh, once you have a satellite launched, of course it operates, say, for 5, for 10, for 15 years, but at the end of its life, uh, the signatories promise to bring it out of, uh, of orbit uh, and burn it up in the atmosphere in order to keep using the orbits because we need them for daily life, uh, because the satellites there are serving every citizen every single day. Josef Aschbacher, thank you for answering our questions.
Thank you. Great pleasure.